We can start. When did you go out from the country? Like, okay, uh, it's interesting how certain events happen by chance. Uh, I left Ethiopia in 1974, and at that time, uh, the student movement was quite uh, strong. Uh, the university was closed down uh, because of student arrest. At that time, it used to be called Haile Selassie First University. And so I was not doing anything. My cousin and I accompanied my grandmother to Debrelibanos. So when we were there, we were bored, and so him and I decided to hitchhike to Fitchi, right? So we met this man who gave us a ride, and then he asked me, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything. The, the university is closed down. So he said to me, uh, when you come to Addis Ababa, get in touch with me, I'll find you employment. I said, great. So uh, I, I met him when I went back and uh, I worked for him for a while. And then one day he invited me to a party at his apartment. And there, there was a Canadian that I met. She asked me what I was doing. I told her the same story. And then she said, why don't you go to Canada and finish your education? I said, you think that's possible? She said, sure. So that's how I ended up uh, leaving Ethiopia in 1974. What were you studying before you left the country? Uh, I was at Haile Selassie First University. I was studying uh, economics and political science. So did you finish studying economics? So yeah, when I went to Canada, I was a transfer student. At that time, Haile Selassie University has a very good reputation, academic reputation. And because of that reputation, I was able to transfer most of my credit to the university. So I arrived in Canada in October, and I was able to start my education in uh, January. So I was a transfer student. So I was, uh, I believe, a third year student at Haile Selassie First University. Uh, I lost some credit, but I was able to finish my undergraduate studies uh, in Canada at a university called the University of Guelph. Yeah, so that was in 1976, yeah, yeah. Then what happened? Then what happened, um, I had planned to obviously return uh, to Ethiopia, but the dirt came to power. The political situation was not really conducive uh, to return. Many of my friends were in prison, and some were killed, and therefore I decided to stay longer. So I pursued my... Uh, graduate studies. Uh, I was accepted to McGill University in uh, Montreal. That's one of the best universities in Canada. So I did my master's degree uh, and then I continued to also do my PhD degree at the same university. Uh, so yeah, that's how I ended up um, going from Canada to, from, from uh, Ethiopia to Canada, and then from that uh, the undergraduate program to the graduate program in Montreal. Now you are a professor of economics, right? You teach economics. Yes, I, I teach economics at a college called Dawson College in Montreal, and I'm also the chair of the Department of Economics. And uh, to my surprise, I have been elected chair by my colleagues for the last 15 years. So you can say that I'm a popular Ethiopian within my department. How did you get into teaching? You know, again, it's very, very fascinating how things just happen by chance. Uh, I was talking to my um, supervisor uh, about my thesis. And as I was talking to him, he received a call from the college. The chairman of the college asked my supervisor if he knew someone who can teach. And I heard him on the phone, the professor saying, uh, no, I don't know anybody. And then he looked at me and said, wait a second, work who? Will you be interested in teaching? <laughs> I said, sure, I can try it. You know? So uh, I uh, applied for the position. Uh, many people did. I was interviewed and apparently 
uh, I did quite well and I was uh, offered the position. So that's how it happened. So you go from like straight from studying to teaching? Exactly. So uh, uh, I just had finished my master's degree and I started teaching. So when I was doing my PhD program, I was uh, teaching at the same time as I was studying and uh, doing my studies. So that, that was quite a bit challenging to work and to study at the same time. But you make it, right? Yeah, I made it. I made it. Yeah. And at the same time, actually, towards the end of the program, uh, not only was I studying, writing my thesis, and working, but I also had to take care of two children. So it, it was quite demanding, but uh, I made it. So yeah. when did you get back to Ethiopia for the first time? For the first time, I returned to Ethiopia in 1989. That was just before the drug was about to uh, uh, fall down. And uh, before that, I was warned not to return. It wasn't safe because, as I told you, many of my friends were killed and many died. But I took a chance. Uh, so it, it, it was quite, quite uh, uh, a shock to go back after something like 20 years, you know, quite, 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 quite a, a change. Um, and I sensed at that time that things were kind of moving, people were becoming more and more um, assertive of their political statements. They were no longer afraid of Mangustu. Uh, if you remember, there was a priest who got up in parliament and made a, a speech about how Mangustu is really ruining the country and so on and so forth. So that was the time when I returned uh, to Ethiopia. How was it? Uh, I, as I said, I still had to be very careful because uh, many of my friends were in prison, many of my friends were members of the EPRP. Uh, so I had to be cautious. Uh, I, I was cautious, yeah. So you didn't decide to stay in the country then? No, no absolutely no. no there didn't. is no chance of staying in the country in that state? No, no, not a chance. Not a chance because uh, I uh, was at that time a member of the EPRP, like most of the students of my generation. Uh, as I said, many of my uh, friends, classmates, uh, acquaintances were uh, either imprisoned or murdered. Uh, so, in fact, uh, many of my uh, relatives didn't want me to return. They said, look, you're really being uh, uh, silly here, coming back with all the stories that have happened. But I took a chance, and I'm glad I did. That's a good thing. But what makes you come? Like, why did you come when you know, like, it's thrilling in the country? Yeah, I, I, I was curious. I was really curious as to what was happening. I also got the sense that this was really the beginning of the end of the Mengistu regime. So it wasn't like at the peak of the Red Terror. Uh, that has kind of passed. Um, and at the same time, uh, there were talks between the Derg and the EPLF trying to come up with some kind of negotiated settlement. Uh, the TPLF was not as strong as we thought, you know, it turned out. Uh, and so, I was hoping that perhaps there was a possibility of peaceful transition to uh, a government supported by most people. And you wanted to contribute your part in that uh, transition? Uh, uh, just to, to assess, to assess the, the situation and if possible, sure, yes. Then what happened? Then um, I returned and then what was quite shocking for us was, I believe there was some kind of a, a coup d'etat attempt that did not succeed. Um, and I had come with a cousin to Bahrdar at that time, and the TPL was, uh, TPLF was advancing. It was in Gondor, and uh, they were in Gondor, and they were sort of moving towards uh, uh, Bahrdar, we were told, and again, I was told it was not safe to be in Bahrdar. Now, what was interesting was, as I was visiting around, uh, my cousin and I took some pictures, and I was just taking pictures, you know, uh, of the Blue Nile, the bridge. So there was a soldier who was guarding the bridge. He told him to stop. I said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. 
I said, look, don't you realize that, you know, the TPLF is coming and you're taking, I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize. So he uh, arrested us and took us to the police station. Our crime was for taking pictures. I said, oh my God, I'm going to be in trouble, you know. Uh, luckily, the uh, officer who was in charge of the police station understood what I was doing and said, please, just leave Bahadar quietly. I want you to leave right away. I said, thank you very much, sir. I took the plane in the afternoon and I left Bahadar. Then when did you return back to Ethiopia after that? Uh, then it was uh, 11 years ago, uh, during 2010, 2010. 2010, uh, my daughter uh, had just graduated from high school. Uh, she plays soccer and I used to coach her. And at that time, there was the World Cup that was being held in South Africa. So I promised her that I would take her uh, to the World Cup. And uh, if she did very well. It so happened that she did very well in her uh, high school. I had to keep my promise. So I said to her, look, uh, we'll go to South Africa, but on the way, we'll visit uh, Ethiopia too. So that was in 2010. Wow. Then tell me about the difference. The difference was that um, definitely uh, what's quite impressive is when you've been away for a while and come back to Addis Ababa, the city had expanded quite, quite tremendously, huge, huge expansion, I was quite struck by the increase in population. Uh, as I was driving, uh, I, I drove from Addis Ababa th through Baghdad to Magali, I could really sense the population density. It wasn't like that when I was a kid, I mean, quite, quite huge. So that was quite uh, impressive. And then, uh, obviously, I wasn't quite um, happy with the way the Ethiopian politics was going, the emphasis on ethnicity, that was contrary to what we stood for. We believed in, uh, in the student movement, that is, uh, in a common goal for all Ethiopians. Our slogan was land for the tailor. We didn't make any distinction. So that was a little bit disappointing. Um, so, the huge change, the, the demographic change that I, I saw, uh, the expansion of Addis Ababa, coupled with the political climate, uh, was quite shocking for someone who has been outside Ethiopia for a long time. But you still are coming back, right? I, I'm still coming back, but obviously, sure. Uh, still I'm coming back and uh, I'll continue coming back because um, it, it, we're Ethiopians. We love our country, regardless of the political situation. We love Ethiopians. And we feel that as Ethiopians who live abroad, we have a share to contribute, however minor it could be. Uh, so that's why uh, I come and I am more or less kind of detached from the political situation. I don't belong to any political party. But at least what I believe is that as an Ethiopian educated by the taxpayers of Ethiopians, I have a duty and responsibility to pay back the Ethiopian people. And the way to do that, in my opinion, is at least uh, share my views with my fellow Ethiopians, educate some Ethiopians. Uh, and so I, I plan to uh, come back and forth and um, teach some graduate uh, courses, oh. so yeah. You have a plan to do that? I, I do, I, yes, I, I have a plan. In fact, um, two years ago, I gave a course at uh, Awasa University. And um, in order to make the um, contribution significant, uh, you'll have to do it in an organized manner. One individual can't go far, so uh, we're, getting together with uh, a bunch of uh, like-minded Ethiopians um, in which we'll be able to 
come to Ethiopia, give uh, short-term courses, intensive courses, and return. This way, uh, we'll have a stronger impact than just one individual teaching one or two courses. In 2016, I was invited to attend a conference at Addis Ababa University, and I uh, presented a paper on the uh, ethiopian Eritrean economic relationship. Uh, after that, I was able to have contact with university presidents, uh, academic, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, uh, academic deans. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I was able to go to Awasa to give that lecture. So I still have contacts with a number of academic deans. Hopefully, it will develop into something more uh, wider than just one individual. So you are a professor of economics. Right, yes. So we should talk about economics, right? Sure, we can if you want to. We yes. can talk about like Ethiopian economy. Uh, yes, we can, sure, sure. So how do you see it like as an economist? Uh, as an economist, uh, how, how do I feel about the Ethiopian economy? Okay, so uh, yeah, the government claims that the Ethiopian economy has been growing, as they say, double digit, right? Uh, but you have to be cautious because there is a political motive to exaggerate their achievements, right? Uh, and so, although they may say that it's 10%, so the actual rate is lower than that. So when you look at, for example, the reports submitted by the IMF or the World Bank, they discount this number by about three percentage points. So when the government claims, let's say, 10%, the IMF or the World Bank will say it's more like 7%. Okay? So still 7% is significant. Uh, you know, one cannot really... Uh, sort of undermine that. The main question is not whether there has been economic growth or not. There has been, you know, we can look at it, you can see it visibly. The question that arises is uh, how equitably is that growth distributed? I mean, that's why you have had political unrest for the last uh, five, six years. Yeah, so yes, there has been some impressive growth, but there are issues of development. So that's a, a political problem that needs to be addressed. The other is when you look at the source of growth of the Ethiopian economy, it's mostly based on government spending, uh, mostly on infrastructure and buildings, construction. You don't see as much growth in the manufacturing sector. In fact, when you look at the share of manufacturing out of GDP, it's, it's quite ironic. It has declined compared to what it was during Haile Selassie's time and during the Dirk's time. So uh, manufacturing has not expanded as it should. And when you look at economic transformation, uh, improvement in standard of living, uh, the main sector that contributes to those changes is the manufacturing sector. So the government should emphasize that, right? Uh, now, obviously, uh, when you look at uh, economic growth, development, and so on, uh, there is a link between the political system, the political situation, and economic growth, right? So at least at an elementary level, you have to have peace and stability. Without peace and stability, there is no investment. And of course, without investment, there can't be economic growth. Uh, so if the government wishes to promote economic growth and hence development, then it should really take the initiatives to address the political problems facing the country. As an economist, I really wanted to ask you about the loan, the, the huge loans that Ethiopia is taking from everywhere. So here's the thing, you see, the view about the loan uh, it's like you take an individual, right? Okay? You go to a bank and borrow money, right? So let's say you borrowed uh, 100,000 bur. Now, if you invest that money in good business, you'll be able to make money, right? Uh, and that's in fact why people borrow money. But on the other hand, if you blew away 
the $100,000. If you bought uh, expensive clothes, expensive uh, cars, well, there's not going to be any return on it, right? So part of the problem with the money that was borrowed by the Ethiopian government is that it was not appropriately used. There is an organization based in Washington, D.C., that reported that since the TPLF came to power, something like $11 billion, dollars, not bill, $11 billion were uh, illegally transferred out of Ethiopia. So th th that's, that's quite a, a problem, right? Uh, and at the same time, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, certain projects uh, that have started, for example, the sugar cane factory uh, that um, uh, did not finish and so on. So you see the embezzlement of misuse of uh, public funds. That's one of the reasons. So when you look at Ethiopia's debt, uh, something like, I believe, 53% uh, is internal debt debt owed to Ethiopians, and the other 40-something percent is owed to foreigners. So uh, the way you assess the significance of the debt is in relation to the economy. Just as let's say an individual who has an income of $100,000 uh, borrows $50,000, well, he's going to be indebted 50%. If on the other hand, uh, an individual who has $100,000 borrow, borrows $100,000 is going to be indebted 100%, right? So economists look at debt in relative terms. So you have the debt GDP ratio. When you look at that for Ethiopia, it's relatively low. I think it's about 50 something percent. However, when you look at Ethiopia's capacity to pay the debt, uh, it is very low. Okay? Uh, other countries, uh, developed countries like, let's say, Belgium, uh, Japan, Italy, have a GDP debt ratio, a, a debt GDP ratio of about 100%. Okay? But people are not worried. Why aren't they worried? Because these countries can pay the debt, whereas Ethiopia uh, is not capable of, if it continues like this, uh, is going to be in a difficult position to pay its debt. So those are the issues regarding the debt. So we got hope, right? Yes, we can hope. Uh, what uh, the Ethiopian government should do is to make sure that when you borrow money, it's used for the appropriate purpose, not that it is misused or embezzled or put in foreign banks. Uh, that's one. Uh, second, uh, the Ethiopian government also should take uh, other measures to make sure that it has enough revenue uh, that is collecting enough taxes to pay for the debt. Right now it isn't. Uh, for example, when you look at the amount of goods that are smuggled out of Ethiopia, that's quite substantial. So Ethiopia is losing a huge amount of tax revenue because people are not paying enough taxes, especially big companies and uh, well-off people. And secondly, when you look at um, uh, exports, Ethiopia is not uh, getting uh, enough export earnings because uh, you have a lot of smuggling. Uh, for example, uh, live animals that are smuggled out of Ethiopia worth billions of dollars. Uh, therefore, the government has to clamp down on illegal smuggling and find ways of raising uh, collective revenue. Ethiopia exports cattle, uh, sheep, and earns you know, foreign uh, exchange earnings. Uh, so instead of uh, selling it to these governments through recognized agencies, you have individuals who are smuggling, smuggling them out without reporting to the government, and they keep the money, you see? Yeah, so uh, there is an ambassador named, I think, Suleiman, who really, really says that Ethiopia is only receiving 10% of the revenue that it should get from the export of live cattle, live animals. Now I am going to ask you a personal question. Sure. You mentioned about soccer. Right. And you were coaching your daughter. Yes. So did you play soccer? 
Uh, yes, uh, I used to play. I used to play soccer uh, in high school, um, and of course um, in Canada. I'm sure, you know, maybe it's to some extent here too. As a father, as a dad, you have to spend time with your kids. So we uh, took the kids to teach them how to play the piano, uh, ballet dancing, uh, and so on and so forth, along with uh, physical activities. So in the winter, they would be skating and skiing, and in the summer, uh, I started coaching them. In fact, I was so involved in coaching my children, my son and my daughter, I got a coaching license. So I'm a licensed coach. I, 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 I'm, I have the license to coach even national teams. You know? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I coached my to, uh, daughter, and she, she loves uh, uh, soccer. Every time there is a, a World Cup uh, match, we watch together. We have fun, yeah. Wow. So you are raising your children as Canadian or as an Ethiopian? <laughs> uh, th 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 that is uh, an interesting question. Uh, it, it, it's almost impossible to raise your children as Ethiopians when you live abroad. Okay? What you wish the best could happen is that they maintain uh, the Ethiopian culture, the Ethiopian language, and the Ethiopian values. And that, I think, I've succeeded to some extent. Uh, because they were born in Canada, they're Canadians, uh, but at the same time, uh, because I'm Ethiopian, they're very much familiar with uh, Ethiopian history, Ethiopian culture. They're exceptionally uh, proud Ethiopians, and I'm glad that... Uh, and they speak Amharic? Uh, a little bit. Not, not perfectly, a little bit. They do. Just for conversations, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, again, that's not easy because um, where I live, it's a small community. There are not that many Ethiopians. Although the community tried to organize um, community activities, uh, teaching uh, the kids uh, Amharic, uh, the, uh, you know, the letter, even uh, Ethiopian uh, musical instruments, how to play the mazinko, the krar, and so on. Uh, it's not always easy. You, you're sort of going back and forth between work uh, and the children and so on. Uh, so they are Canadians, but they are also proud Ethiopians. So they have uh, a mixture of both cultures. Ethiopian reform. Are we really on a reform? Well, okay. Uh, th there has been some changes. There is no question about that. Uh, the Abiy government has introduced some changes. For example, the media is now open, right? Uh, he has released political prisoners, but in order for the reform to become permanent, they have to be institutionalized. Without them being institutionalized, they can be taken away anytime. So that's quite uh, important. Uh, now, how do you proceed? That is a very difficult question to answer. Uh, some people think that uh, perhaps what the government should do is that it should bring the opposition, um, civic organizations, uh, intellectuals and communities and uh, come up with a road map where everybody participates. And I think the Prime Minister is not willing to do that. He thinks that he and, or his government will be able to do that. I'm not sure if that's uh, possible. So uh, Ethiopia is, in my opinion, at a very critical stage uh, where, unfortunately, uh, the level of extremism has increased. Um, and to some extent, I think the inability of the government to take certain actions, decisive actions, uh, may have contributed to that. So it's, it's a very, very complex, uh, difficult situation. Uh, while I am quite optimistic about the Prime Minister, I am very, very worried and concerned 
where the country may go. I'm really worried about that. Given the rise of extremism, given the level of conflict, ethnic conflict that's taking place in the country, I worry where will Ethiopia be a year from now if this continues. Especially if the government plans to hold elections as it says, then I think that's going to create many, many, many problems. Uh, when there is a reform, there is a saying, there right. will be a hope and a fear. Sometimes right. the hope consumes the fear and it will be okay, and sometimes the fear consumes the hope and it will be like messy. Right. And I hope that the hope consumes the fear for Ethiopia, as you say, like it's optimistic. Let's talk about the student moment. Right. Your, your generation of Ethiopia right. and our generation of Ethiopia. Right. Do you think like we have an Ethiopia now? You know, I, I, I have to say that I'm very, very disappointed with what I hear. Uh, as I said before, when we're in the student movement, our goal was one Ethiopia. Our slogan was one slogan, land for the tailor. We didn't make any distinction whatsoever between this ethnic group, that ethnic group, between this religion, that religion, this region, that region. We stood for all Ethiopians. Now, people may uh, disagree that socialism may be a bad idea, but at least what you have is that you have unity of purpose, idealism, right? So when I hear in the news that a student at Deborah Marcos University was killed because he's a Tigray, I really, really get angry. I get depressed. How is it possible that an individual is attacked and killed simply because of his ethnicity? It just does not make sense. It's deplorable that something like this happens. And then I hear as some kind of retaliation, an Amara student is killed at Oxford University. Again, that is deplorable. So when I uh, hear news like that, when I uh, sense that people are very much uh, worried about even uh, telling where they're born, where they come from, because they're afraid that they may be associated with one ethnic group or the other, that kind of uh, worries me and disappoints me. So to answer your question, I believe that there has been a shift in value a shift in value that emphasizes locality, ethnicity, as opposed to Ethiopianness, unity, togetherness. And uh, that will take a while. And I think it's because of what happened over the last 27 years. Uh, definitely, it will take time. But at the same time, I believe that if you were to look at the core values of uh, all Ethiopians, regardless of which ethnic group they belong to, there is that common core that we share that will bring us together as a nation. Now I want you to make a point. You live in Canada. Right. You are from Ethiopia. Right. So when people first saw you, yeah. see you, yeah. what did they see? Okay, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, I get all kinds of uh, reaction. Most people, I don't know, for some strange reason, don't think that I'm from Ethiopia. When I said, wow, uh, sometimes People ask me, where do you come from? And I jokingly say, what do you think I come from, right? So they're all over the map. Uh, so when I, I tell them about Ethiopia, the older generation remember Haile Selassie, oh, the land of Haile Selassie, or Ababa Bikila, right? Uh, the younger generation, uh, or people of a little bit younger than me, think of the famine, and I did four famines. So is, is, is it okay now, you know? That kind of thing. Uh, so, I do get uh, different reactions based on which generation that I, I, I'm talking to, right? Uh, occasionally, uh, people who have been to Ethiopia identify me as an Ethiopian and they speak to me, uh, oh, how are you doing? Uh, which part of Ethiopia do you come from? Uh, let me tell you an interesting story. I was at... Uh, a restaurant downtown Montreal. So I was sitting at a table, and this white man 
comes and sits next to me. While there are empty tables all over, I said, oh, this is strange. You know, why would he sit next to me when there are empty tables? So I was a little bit uncomfortable, but I, you know, I, I'm polite. I'm Ethiopian, right? I'm polite, so I just let him uh, sit there. So uh, finally, he says to me in Amharic, "Ndo ya garachun guda indethno." So you see, he uh, is an Armenian who was uh, raised and born in Ethiopia, but lived in, uh, lives in Montreal. I was shocked. I was told because I didn't expect it. So that was why he sat uh, next to me. When you say you are from Ethiopia, yeah. people didn't ask which ethnicity did you come from, right? Absolutely no, of course. You see, this is the irony for a Canadian or for um, an American. It doesn't matter which ethnic group you belong to. In fact, it doesn't matter whether you're a Kenyan or a Nigerian or a Sudanese uh, or a, a native Canadian or a native uh, uh, black American. You're a black person. You're a black person. It doesn't matter. You right? are just black. You're a black person, exactly. There is no distinction. Well, sometimes when they speak to you, then you, they hear that you have a different kind of accent and so on, then they ask you. But in general, people don't care about uh, which ethnicity or which country you belong to. They do that because the difference is visible. The right. black and the white are like a, has a different in race, right? Sure. So sure, it is yeah. recognizable. You can see somebody, he's white or he's black, right? right? Definitely, so sure. You don't yeah. have to ask where, which ethnicity he's from, which country he's from, right? The right. first thing yeah. a person can see is your blackness. Exactly. So that's what they think. <laughs> they don't see an Ethiopian, they don't see a Somali, they don't see an Eritrean. All they see is a black person. So right? That's how you're seen, you know? All Ethiopians out of their country Right. Are black people. Yes. Right? Right. They yeah. are not Romo, they are not Amhara. Yeah, no. It's interesting you say that. I, uh, um, I say to my students, I became black when I came to Canada. Right? Because here in Ethiopia, I, I blend you know, quite, quite easily. People don't see me as a black person. You see an individual, Worku or Kabbada or Waldemaria, right? You're an individual. Whereas when you go to a place you know, in Europe or Canada or the United States, you lose your individual identity and you become, uh, you take the collective identity of the group that people think you belong to. Yeah. So yes, you, you're a black person. That's how they look at it. So for the world, all Ethiopians are black people. Exactly. Although Ethiopians may have a different point of view, that's a different story, but yeah. that's how they look at it. So uh, some um, nationalists, for example, uh, Oromos, when say, uh, people ask them, uh, are you Ethiopian? They say, no, 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 I'm from Oromia. And people are confused. What do you mean? What do I do? Where, where is it? You know? uh, so yeah, there is that. And it's quite um, disappointing because you rarely hear a Kenyan describe himself as I'm a Kukuyu I'm or that. People say I'm Kenyan, right? A Nigerian who lives in Canada or the United States describes himself as Nigerian. He doesn't say I'm a Hausa, I'm a Yubo or anything. No. But among some ethnic nationalists, you see that kind of uh, trend. And it's unfortunate because we're all Ethiopians. And above all, as I said, you're seen as a black person. It doesn't matter. Yeah, You are a human, then you are a black person, then you, you become an Ethiopian, exactly. right? Ethnicity doesn't matter right. when you are outside Ethiopia. No, it shouldn't matter. Really, yeah. it shouldn't matter. Some politicians say it is possible to be a proud Amara, a proud Oromo, and a proud Ethiopian. There is no conflict. There should not be any conflict. It doesn't mean that you have to choose one over the other. You can have different identities and be proud of them. Sure. Yeah, we, we can be diversified. 
right. and we can be an Ethiopian too, right? Yes. The only thing we should learn is coexistence, I think, right? Right. With, yeah. with my individual identity, yes. as an Amara or as an Oromo, I can be an Ethiopian. So yeah. what I wanted to say and to make a point about this is like outside Ethiopia, yeah. we're just black people. Right. Yeah. Sure. That's so exact. Like, yeah. We are seen as black people. There is no distinction. The ethnic differences are totally irrelevant. The differences uh, among countries uh, is relevant. It's only a handful of people, people who are educated, who can tell, let's say, uh, regional differences. Let's say Ethiopians, Somalis, and Sudanese may look alike compared to people from West Africa. So they may say, well, you look like someone from uh, East Africa. You don't look like someone from West Africa, okay? For some. Uh, for the majority, you're just a black person. It doesn't matter. Yeah, some of them just call us Africans. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So again, let me tell you a funny story. This was when uh, I first arrived uh, in Canada. I was working as a waiter in a student um, cafeteria. Uh, and we got together after that, we went for a drink. So a bunch of us taking class together, we're having a beer and um, talking about all kinds of things. So, there was this American student. He asked me, uh, how did you come from Ethiopia to Canada? And I said, jokingly, I rode the camel, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was joking. He believed me. <laughs> yeah, you did? I said, yes. So he says to me, by the way, how did you cross the Mediterranean? <laughs> I said, yeah, just the camel hopped, it jumped over the Mediterranean. <laughs> yeah, that kind of ignorance. So here's a good example. Uh, when I was doing my master's degree, I took a course, an advanced course in undergraduate uh, economics uh, to, to qualify for the master's program. So uh, at the end of the first class, I stayed behind and asked, you know, was going to ask questions um, to the professor. So he says to me, just look, you know, looks at me and says, this course is an advanced course. It's for honors students, right? Look, he didn't even listen to my question. Do you understand what he's getting? Okay. I said, okay, yeah, so that's okay, you know, but I have a question. So I asked him the question. I was so angry that he made this assumption because I'm black that this course is too advanced for me, right? right? So this, is, this is really advanced. This is really an honors uh, course. So I said, I'm going to teach this man a lesson. So I worked very, very hard. There were 80 students. And guess who got the best mark? I did, <laughs> right? So he was so impressed, he made me his teaching assistant the next year. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my views on various uh, issues. Um, uh, as I said, uh, one thing that worries me is the political situation in Ethiopia. I hope uh, the political leaders will have the wisdom and the courage to come together and come up with a political solution that will keep us united. If Ethiopian people are united, uh, we can really, really achieve. We, we can do a lot. We can really be examples uh, for Africa. But if we're divided, uh, nobody's going to win. Everybody's going to lose. This idea that you're going to have a separate Tigray, a separate Arama, Amhara, a separate Oromia, it doesn't work. It's going to be chaos. So uh, if I were to make a plea, I will. Uh, plea, I'll make a plea to politicians to come up with a solution that will keep us united and that we move forward to establishing a democratic, united and prosperous Ethiopia. <laughs>